Welcome back, everybody. Um, we are ready to yeah, start the next session. And we are privileged to have Professor Roy Martins from UWC, who will be talking to us about cosmology with Meerkat and the Square Kilometer Array Observatory. Uh, Roy, please. Thank you, Larry Tori. Perhaps, perhaps we could pull the curtain across at the back there because it's shining on the sunlight is shining on the screen. Thanks. Great. Right. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you to the organizers of this FS meeting, this very interesting and timely meeting. And also thanks for giving me the opportunity to talk. I will be talking about cosmology with Meerkat and the SKA. But let me start by just highlighting the fact that in some senses, we're going through a golden age of astronomy in Africa. In Southern Africa in particular, we are already into this golden age. But as we saw in previous talks, there's a golden age potentially coming, spreading across the whole of Africa, hopefully. So what, well, first of all, I need to work out how to work this. There we go. Yeah. Sorry. So in Southern Africa, we have these major internationally supported facilities, Hess and Salt, Meerkat, and which is turning into the SKA. And these are major survey machines, which are studying stars, transients, galaxies, and Meerkat and the SKA will also be doing a significant amount of cosmology, which is the focus of my talk. But these really are fantastic instruments that already exist in Southern Africa and are being expanded uh, continually. The SKAO in particular will be extending Meerkat by two thirds of Meerkat's, double Meerkat's current size. And in fact, I should also mention that there are two further cosmological radio telescopes, one already operating in an earlier phase called HERA and Hyrax in busy in development with, with uh, dishes not yet constructed on site, both of them hosted by the Meerkat site in Carnarvon. So not, not only is the SKAO and its precursor Meerkat, but there is a hero, which is like a precursor of SKA Low and Hyrax, which is like a partner of, uh, of the SKA Mid. But as I mentioned, the golden age of astronomy is also spreading into the rest of Africa, we hope. And I just wanted to identify, at least from my own knowledge, the existing observatories that we have in Africa, in Algeria, Egypt, Ethiopia, Morocco, and also in Nigeria and Mauritius, radio telescopes there, and in Burkina Faso. I probably have missed out some telescopes. I did a bit of research, but I'm not an expert, so please, anyone knows of any telescopes or observatories that I've missed, um, please let me know. And there's also something I don't really know much about, the African Integrated Observatory System, but which sounds very exciting. And perhaps someone will be talking about that in this conference. But that's a very encouraging development, along with the African VLBI program, which is quite closely linked to the SKA, but also is independent of it. And finally, let me just point out that the SKA Observatory, Currently, uh, SKO Mid will be based entirely in South Africa, but in future phases of the SKA, the plan is for 
uh, stations to be built in other eight other partner countries. And there's a very good example of how this might start emerging before SK phase two in Ghana, where the Kutunzi radio uh, telecommunication satellite has been converted with the help of UK and South African astronomers and engineers into a radio telescope. And there I've listed the eight partner countries in the SKA who are also involved in SKA phase one, but whose countries will be hosting stations in the years to come. So let me move from there to cosmology, which is relevant for Meerkat and the SKA and amongst those uh, facilities that I mentioned. Cosmology is the study of the universe on the largest scales. And the next generation of galaxy surveys will be distinguished by the fact that they will cover very wide areas of the sky and they will reach to deeper redshifts, in other words, further away from us in distance and further back in time than current galaxy surveys. And this is opening up a real golden age in cosmology, which is in a sense primarily the golden age of precision, because these surveys will reach sub percent precision for our measurements of dark matter and dark energy, the two core ingredients in the universe as we understand it in current cosmology. And dark energy, sorry, dark matter, as you remember, is essentially the stuff, still not detected, but hopefully will be, but is the stuff that actually builds and stabilizes galaxies, it forms the framework in which baryons actually gather to form stars. While dark energy is the stuff, the field, which accelerates the universe, countering the uh, gravitational attraction between galaxies as the universe expands. And understanding the nature of the dark sector is a key, key, the key goal in current cosmology. Next generation surveys, including the SKAO, will make tremendous progress along this to sub percent precision. But they will do more than that. They will do more than just get more accurate, more precision than we currently have. They will make new discoveries. And this will largely be based on the fact that they are probing such huge volumes of the universe with a wide sky area and the high redshift reach. And in particular, I will talk about one new probe of the universe, the probe of the birth of the universe or the primordial universe. But let me first list for you the key some of the key flagship next generation galaxy surveys. So the first one here is Euclid, the space borne satellite, which is due to be launched in the next year or two. It keeps getting delayed, but that's par for the course for all astronomical projects, it seems. The next one is a ground, ground based telescope, DESI, the dark energy spectroscopic instrument. That's actually already beginning early operations. Then there's the MONSTER, the Rubin Observatory's LSST survey, a huge photometric survey. And the last on my list, last but not least, the SKA Observatory, which comes in two forms. On your left is the mid-frequency array, which is located in South Africa and for which Meerkat is the first part. And on the right, the right is the low-frequency array located in Australia. So radio astronomy, a large part of radio cosmology, not radio astronomy, a large part of radio cosmology relies on the fact that neutral hydrogen emits radio waves. And so if we look at a cartoon of the history of the universe highlighting the role of hydrogen, hydrogen didn't exist until about 400,000 years after the birth of the universe, because that was when it was first cool enough as the universe expands, it cools down. That was the first time it was cool enough for protons to capture electrons and to remain uh, stable as hydrogen atoms. So there then followed a period of the dark ages when the universe, baryonically speaking, was dominated by neutral hydrogen, which is emitting radio waves, but no current or next generation telescope will be able to detect those radio waves. This is for the next next generation of telescopes, so I won't talk more about that. But this dark age has ended in the cosmic dawn when finally the first stars were formed with, by the very same hydrogen clouds that dominated the universe. And those stars 
Many of them were highly energetic. They began to ionize the hydrogen around them. And so there followed the reionization epoch, which is mapped by SKA low. And there, the hydrogen starts off all outside of galaxies and ends up at the end of reionization, nearly all inside galaxies, shielded from ionizing radiation. So SKO mid, when it's detecting the neutral hydrogen signal, is essentially detecting galaxies because nearly all of the hydrogen, neutral hydrogen, is inside galaxies. The intergalactic medium is ionized. So what is the basis of this radio emission from neutral hydrogen? Well, it's a very simple but beautiful fact that when the electron which circles the proton in neutral hydrogen as its spin aligned with that of the proton, it's at a slightly higher energy state than when the spins are anti-aligned. And so there is a spin flip transition to a lower energy state, which releases a very weak photon, 21 centimeter wavelength in the rest frame of the hydrogen atom. And if you detect the signal, then by the well-known redshift rule that one plus Z is the wavelength you measure over 21 centimeters, you've got a very incredibly precise measure of the redshift of the hydrogen emitting object. And that's the basis for spectroscopy in the radio regime with the SKA and any other radio telescope array. Now, the problem with this kind of spectroscopy is that to the, the hydrogen emission is extremely weak. There's a lot of hydrogen, but it's a very weak signal. And so as you go further and further away to higher redshifts, you require more and more sensitivity and more and more dishes and more and more of an instrument in order to detect individual galaxies by their H1 emission. And so it has been realized in the last decade or so, and particularly been pushed by the SKA collaboration, this is the Cosmology Science Working Group of the SKAO, has been pushing for and successfully got it to be recognized that there's another way of doing spectroscopy without detecting individual galaxies. So instead of trying to detect individual galaxies, you simply add up or integrate the total H1 emission in each pixel. And this will give you a low resolution picture of the large scale structure in the universe. So you see in the cartoon there, the individual galaxies are shown as dots on the left, would take you a very long time to detect, say, a, a billion of them. But if you want to, if you're only interested in the fluctuations on larger scales, you're not interested in drilling down to the size of galaxies, then you can happily just have the image on the right, which is something like the CMB map that we know so well. But it's the CMB map at any redshift that you decide, given the frequency at which your dishes and your receivers are tuned. So it's a fantastic idea that gives you extremely accurate redshifts, the most accurate redshifts, far better than any optical spectroscopy, the highest level of accuracy in redshifts. And it allows you to map huge volumes of the universe very quickly. It does have problems, but I'm just telling you the advantages for now. The SKA plans a survey which will go from redshift point one to three, which is a larger redshift range than any galaxy survey or doing spectroscopy, a survey area of 20,000 square degrees, also larger than any planned galaxy survey. So it really is the premier spectroscopic survey. It does have a big problem of foregrounds, but that's, that's something that's being addressed. Just like the CMB had a problem of foregrounds and they've been cleaned successfully, so too this will happen with H1 intensity mapping. So up to now, the signal has not been detected except in cross-correlation with spectroscopic galaxy samples because the instruments, the current radio telescopes are not really sensitive enough. The SKA will definitely have the ability to do this. And in fact, Meerkat also has the ability to do it. Meerkat hasn't yet done it, but early detection is, is on the cards for Meerkat, as I'll explain shortly. There's a South African led team, which is actually leading the world essentially in this, in this effort, trying to use Meerkat 
to prepare the way for the SKA intensity mapping survey and doing this quite successfully. Hopefully this team is going to make the first auto power measurements of the intensity mapping signal using Meerkat uh, even before the SKA is completed. So let me just say something about Meerkat. Meerkat was not designed as a cosmological machine. It was designed uh, for something completely different, for transients and for pulse, things like pulsars and for galaxy evolution studies. But it turned out to be actually a very good survey machine as well. And its, its specs uh, would deliver a very good intensity mapping survey. It has 64 dishes, which have been conducting science operations since 2019. Some fantastic science coming out, not yet any cosmology, but fantastic science nevertheless. And is going to be the one third of the SKAO mid uh, array when that is completed. There is a proposed 21 centimeter cosmological survey as part of the MIR class project, which will be proposed to the, the Meerkat uh, telescope. Currently, before this MIR class survey, which hopefully will be accepted, but before it, it actually runs, there has been a lot of work to uh, look at pilot surveys for intensity mapping and start building the pipeline which can clean the foregrounds, can, can deal with systematics, can measure the RFI, etc., etc. And a lot of work has been done by this international team that I mentioned to you, being led by South Africa. You see the lead authors here, Jingying Wang is a postdoc from UWC, and Mario Santos is the PI at UWC of the Mir class project. So a very uh, intense amount of work has been done to develop a pipeline in preparation for measurements on Meerkat and then on the SKAO. And there's also further work being led by the same team, members of the same team, looking at, in particular, details like the, the primary beam of the Meerkat telescope, insofar as, as it would affect a 21 centimeter survey. So there's some great work going on, and hopefully, fingers crossed, the South African-led team is going to make the first detection of the H1 intensity power spectrum without having to cross-correlate with a galaxy sample. Thanks, Laura. So I'll end with the, the what can the SKAO deliver for us in terms of new science that's not currently possible, but which is actually unlocked by the, the properties of the SKA surveys itself. So it, I mentioned this before, but probing the primordial universe using galaxy surveys is something made possible by these next generation surveys, and in particular the SKAO. So this is the same cartoon as I showed before, but just highlighting inflation, which is, happens just after the birth of the universe and which generates the very same fluctuations, which we see in temperature fluctuations in the CMB at after 400,000 years and which we measure in galaxy number counts and intensity mapping fluctuations at lower redshifts. Now in inflation, very small fluctuations generated by the quantum vacuum get stretched by super fast expansion of the universe driven by this quantum field called the inflaton. And these large scale long wavelength fluctuations are the same ones which provide the seeds for temperature and density fluctuations that generate the CMB and the, the distribution of galaxies that we measure. Now, the important thing about these fluctuations is that in the simplest models of inflation, they are Gaussian, but in more complicated models, which probably are more likely, they are non-Gaussian, these fluctuations. And the, the Gaussianity or the level of non-Gaussianity of these fluctuations, which can be measured simplistically by a single parameter, it can't actually, that's not the end of the story, but this is just a simple, the simplest form of non-Gaussianity can be measured by FNL, the local primordial non-Gaussianity parameter. And FNL, for example, if it is less than one, it rules out many multi-field models of inflation. If it's greater than one, well, then, you know, a whole class of models of inflation can be ruled out depending on how large FNL is. So being able to measure FNL will give us a key probe of conditions in the primordial universe, in the fraction of the second after the beginning of the universe. So how does this actually get to galaxies and to the CMB? 
Well, it turns out that this non-Gaussianity, if it exists in the form of an FNL number of order one, it's imprinted in the primordial universe at inflation. It's frozen on very, very large scales, on the very largest scales. It's not processed by any gravitational instability. It's kind of frozen on those large scales because they remain linear. And it imprints itself, it imprints a signature on the pattern of CMB anisotropies, CMB temperature anisotropies. So the same FNL that we see in the early universe can be measured then at the CMB and it has been constrained. And then it's also imprinted in the distribution of galaxies because all galaxies and the CMB both have their origin in those fluctuations generated in inflation. And so the FNL fossil signal is carried through from the CMB. There it is in the CMB and the Planck satellite has constrained FNL within, within an error of five. So it includes zero, it could be a Gaussian universe, but it doesn't get down to an, a level of where you can distinguish FNL of one, which is the difference between some multi-field models and simpler models. So only galaxy surveys can help us to get down to that level. The same fossil signal, as I mentioned, is imprinted in the pattern of the distribution of galaxies. It's a very weak signal, so you need a huge volume a wide sky area, a long redshift reach, you need a huge volume to detect this weak signal. And that's exactly what SKAO delivers to us, a huge, the biggest volume of all next generation surveys. But it turns out that SKAO on its own, although it can reach of order five or four, it can do as well as the CMB, it can't do better on its own. So what you do is you combine an SKA survey with, say, an LSST survey, which is detecting billions of galaxies, but without accurate redshifts. And it turns out that you, because you've got the spectroscopic accuracy from the SKA, you don't need spectroscopic ac accuracy with the LSST. What you need is the number of galaxies. And if we combine by, by a method called the multi-tracer technique, it's like cross-correlations and autocorrelations, we combine SKA with LSST, we can forecast to get an error down to 0.7, breaking through that threshold of one. And current work is looking into improving this by actually adding a third galaxy survey, adding Euclid on top of that to see what happens. So that's where I will end, but I will leave for you to look at spin-offs for Africa from astronomy. And uh, while you're thinking of questions to ask, I'll move to the next slide as we, as I stop here, but I've just got this slide and another slide on science in Africa. I'll stop there, because Lero is looking at me. Um, we are happy to take questions from here or online. From the room? Um, how about... Um, James? No. Right, thanks. That, that was a very great uh, talk and it would be interesting to um, in the long run see um, co the combination of tracers uh, with SK Ho in the, in the long run and what output it can produce. Okay, so um, it's interesting to know that um, um, the mid class um, collaboration would probably produce the autocorrelation for H1. But since the signal is weak, so which means that the signal to noise ratio might be small, maybe. So, how good without, I mean, to what extent would that be able to constrain cosmology? The autocorrelation for H1. Well, the signal is weak. And that's why we need the SKA to measure it. So if you have enough dishes of the right design, Hyrax can also measure it, for example. Uh, I didn't mention Hyrax, but Hyrax has been designed specifically for cosmology. The SKA was not specifically designed to do this kind of intensity mapping, but Hyrax is designed as an intensity mapping experiment. So if you design an experiment like Hyrax, and you, you can simulate it and compute the signal to noise, it's, it's high. It does very well in cosmology. And then we've also, as the cosmology working group, we've computed the signal to noise for the, for the SKA, and it's just as high 
roughly as as higher X, even though SKA mid was not designed specifically for intensity mapping, it turns out to be as good as higher X, but they they have different properties, different strengths, and they complement each other very well. So it's a good question, but the fact the the answer is simply that you just need to have enough dishes of the right type in the in the right configuration in order to achieve the signal to noise. If you want to do it by detecting individual galaxies, then we have to wait for SKA phase two, because that's that requires many more dishes or stations. Thank you. Um, if we, um, uh, James, do you have the mic? No, you did ask, right? Oh, okay. Okay, um, just a quick one, James, we are running out of time. Oh, okay. We'll take at the end of the session, if um, we have time, we will uh, go back. Is that okay? Are you saying okay to ask? Okay, James, you are ready. Next mic next to you. Thanks a lot, Mario, for, for that very good talk. You made reference to um, a pixel. A uh, pixel. Yeah, yeah, individual pixel. I, I'm assuming that this is individual primary beam of the meerkats. In, in, in this it's case. rough. It's like a, like the optical pixels that we know from a galaxy server. It's just the radio version of that. So, yeah. Yeah. Very good. So yeah. have sometimes you tried, called a voxel. Yes. <laughs> have you tried to do? autocorrelation with 64 dishes of the meerkat say for 18 hours and do you have any information of the sensitivity you achieve and how different is this from what you require for your cosmology science so the simple answer to that is that these pilot surveys are quite small in sky area and also of limited time duration so measurements have been made and it's I'm, I'm not sure i'm not an expert mario santos is the expert he's the one who's leading this sorry i'm i'm you know i'm i'm a more minor player in this but um yes mario would be able to answer that for you but there are initial measurements of the signal um but it's not yet at the stage where confidently can be said that the power spectrum has been measured above the noise but yeah. i'm yeah. I'm optimistic that it's going to happen. We just need a bit more time and a bit more area and hopefully a lot more time and a lot more area to get a strong, strong enough signal to make a, a very confident detection. Any information on whether they are collecting enough data to be able to stack it together to achieve the signal to noise they need? Well, this is ongoing work. So okay. each, you know, each time there's a call for proposals, more, more pilot survey type uh, proposals are being put in to the instrument. Thanks, uh, Roy. Uh, so it's actually Professor Roy Martin, uh, James, not uh, Professor Mario Santos. Um, so let's all thank uh, Roy, please. And um, the next speaker is Dr. Michelle Lochner from UWC University of the Western Cape, and she's going to talk to us about anomaly detection in astronomical data using machine learning. Go, Michelle. Great. I'll try to stand still and not pace. Okay, thank you so much uh, to the organizers for inviting me and a big thanks to the organizers and this very active technical team for running a hybrid conference. It has all the problems of both remote and in person. So <laughs> well done, you guys. Um, so, great. Uh, Okay, so um, as Zara said, I'm Michelle Lochner, I'm a senior lecturer at UWC and a joint staff scientist at Sereo. And uh, my research interest is mostly around applying machine learning to astronomical data. And so I'm gonna be talking specifically about anomaly detection in astronomy, which I think is uh, particularly exciting at the moment. Okay, let's set the stage by pressing the right button. Um, so let's set the stage by uh, talking about the two telescopes that I'm personally most excited about. Thanks so much to Roy for introducing both of these. 
Um, the first is the Verici Rubin Observatory. So if you're not familiar with this, which I'm sure actually probably most of you are, um, this is a big telescope under construction, optical telescope under construction in Chile, big international project led by the US. And it will be running this 10-year legacy survey of space and time, or LSST. And it's, a, it's an amazing instrument. It's got the biggest camera in the world on it, which means it has a, a large uh, field of view, but it's also very deep and it's also very fast. So its big selling point is that it can make a movie of the sky um, by taking observations every three days um, of, of the entire, well, the entire survey size, so about 18,000 square degrees. So in this video, you're looking at every single dot is a newly discovered supernova. And an interesting thing to keep in mind is the big dark energy discovery was made with just 40 supernovae. We're now talking about at least half a million really well-measured type 1A supernovae. And that's not even the mind-boggling number. The mind-boggling number is supernovae are only a small fraction of the transients that will be detected by Rubin. Every single night, it will issue 10 million alerts. 10 million times a night, something will change. Now, half of those are going to be things like satellites. But even if only a small fraction of that is interesting objects, this is an enormous data set that we need to figure out how to handle. On the other side of the spectrum, Royzo mentioned the SKA. We're all deeply, intimately familiar with this project. And uh, the data rates from the SKA, uh, the most scientific term I can think of them is mind-bogglingly enormous. Um, we simply, the, the, the raw data rates are, are simply ridiculous, but even the processed data, we will have a beautiful catalog of over a billion galaxies. We will have not quite the number of transients that the Rubin will detect, but hundreds of thousands of transients, uh, probably millions of uh, pulsar candidates. So again, it's an enormous data set with lots of opportunity for discovery. And we're already kind of drowning in data in the radio because we have the precursor telescopes. So there's Meerkat, which we're all very uh, familiar with, and I'll show you some data from at the end. Um, so this 64-dish kind of precursor to the SKA is already kind of changing how radio astronomers think and how we're used to working with data. You know, we're used to just being able to download a data set to your laptop and you know, you fire up CASA and you do some, do some work with it. But now your observations come, you know, they're about a terabyte big. So we're all sort of having to change how we work with this data and uh, how we process these enormous volumes of it. And of course, uh, Meerkat's not the only telescope pushing the boundaries. There's ASCAP in Australia, very complementary, very exciting instrument doing beautiful big radio surveys. And then of course, there's LOFAR doing the same thing in low frequency. And there are other surveys as well. So basically, we're facing a data explosion. And I like using this picture because this kind of illustrates my feelings about it, because it's very exciting. There's lots of amazing scientific discoveries waiting for us, but it's also an enormous problem to try and manage the sheer quantity of data and at the incredible data rates. So this is why machine learning is becoming so popular in, well, in basically every field in the world, but in particular in astronomy. Now, I know not everybody is very familiar with machine learning. Uh, I'm not going to go into to too much detail, but I thought I wanted to just give a, a very sort of one slide brief introduction. Specifically, uh, I'm going to introduce supervised machine learning and contrast it to what I'm actually going to mostly be talking about, which is unsupervised machine learning. So this is a, a nice sort of classical, um, can you see my, yes, this is a kind of classical supervised machine learning problem where you've got two different types of objects. We've got the circles and we've got the crosses and you'll have some training data. So you'll have some data for which you know, is it a circle or a cross? And what you want the machine learning algorithm to do is to automatically learn a model using this data such that when I find a new object with an unknown class, it can tell me, is it a circle, is it a cross? In this case, it's very easy. The model is just a straight line. But you can imagine that this can become very complicated with more complicated data. So my one sentence summary of supervised machine learning is automatically learn a model to uh, map inputs to outputs using a training set. Now, this that I've just introduced you to, I'm not actually going to talk about at all. So this is supervised machine learning. Pretty much 99% of the machine learning you come across, be it in industry or in astronomy, falls into this type. 
where we're trying to classify things or predict things like redshift, and we have some known training set. But anomaly detection doesn't actually fall into this class because by definition, we don't have training data for anomalies because these might be things that we've never even seen before. So this is a branch of machine learning called unsupervised learning. We have no training data, we just have data, and we have to try to make sense of it. And that's where anomaly detection comes in. Okay, so I think everybody has a kind of intrinsic intuition about what an anomaly is. An anomaly is something rare, something unusual, different from the norm. Here's some examples of some known unknowns, things like strong lenses, fast radio bursts, gravitational waves. These are things that we know to look out for. We know what they are, but they're still very rare. And most of the time, it's still very hard to build actual training sets for them. So for instance, for strong lenses, we don't have very many examples. So when people try to use machine learning to look for strong lenses, they actually have to rely on simulations to train their algorithms, because we just don't have enough data yet. So these are unknown unknowns, which are still anomalies, but are perhaps not the most exciting anomalies out there. The most exciting ones, I think, are the unknown unknowns, the truly new discoveries, the things that we weren't looking for. And the example that I like to give is the discovery of the pulsar in 1967. And I like to give this example because, because of what it took to make this discovery. It took a very bright young graduate student carefully looking through her data and noticing something strange. And many scientific discoveries relied on things like this, often graduate students, <laughs> going through data and finding and detecting weird things. So the question is, how are we gonna make these new discoveries when there's 10 million alerts every night? When your data set has a billion galaxies in it? There's just not enough grad students in the world to go through all this data and make all of these exciting scientific discoveries. So we need something else. We need some level of automation to scientific discovery. And there is a branch of unsupervised machine learning uh, focused on anomaly detection. And most of the algorithms work in, with sort of a similar kind of ideology where you give it data, there's no training because we have no training data, you give it some data, it tries to figure out what the sort of norm looks like, what the most sort of common object looks like, and then identifies objects that are far away from the norm as being anomalous for some definition of far away. So uh, I'm not gonna go into detail into any examples, but these are two very commonly used machine learning algorithms, uh, isolation forest that tries to isolate points, the points that are more easily isolated are more anomalous, Local outlier factor looks for uh, objects in very low density regions. So you can, you can kind of start to, even if you're not familiar with machine learning, you can kind of start to feel, get a feel for how these algorithms could work. And uh, with my collaborators, uh, we've been involved in a couple of novel machine learning anomaly detection al algorithms, drama, making use of deep learning, and BADAC as a Bayesian statistics-based uh, anomaly detection algorithm. So if you wanna go into those details, you know, the papers are there or you can chat to me. But what I really wanted to focus on is this interesting idea that my colleague Bruce Bassett and I had when we first started talking about anomaly detection. We realized pretty early on that anomaly detection alone isn't actually enough, right? That when you apply anomaly detection to your 10 million transient alerts from Rubin or your billion galaxies in your SKA catalog, there, there will be a large number of anomalies, even if they're rare, there's still gonna be a large number of them. And many of them are not gonna be things you're interested in. So for example, these are some uh, optical images. These are real astronomical sources that are unusual, and these are artifacts. So as an astronomer, I'm probably only gonna be interested in the real things. But what we realized is that what's interesting is subjective. So unlike with classification where we can all agree on a spiral versus an elliptical galaxy, we can come up with a classification scheme. Uh, with anomalies, what's interesting to one person might not be interesting to another. Uh, for instance, if you are somebody focused on data quality, you might actually want to know about the artifacts. 
You want to know what artifacts are in your data. Maybe you don't care about the real sources. Or even if you do, maybe you're someone only interested in title tales and not so much in mergers, for example. So there, there's this that kind of psychological aspect to it um, that we realize is quite interesting. And this is where active learning plays a role. Active learning takes the raw processing power of machine learning and combines it with the intuition and expertise of a human. And the goal in active learning is always to make the best use of the human time, because that's the time that's valuable, right? We can have these computers processing billions of galaxies in the background, doesn't matter, but I'm going to get bored after looking at about a thousand, right? So we want to make the best use of the human time possible in order to, to try to guarantee, well, not guarantee, but improve the chances of making genuine scientific discoveries. So putting all the pieces together, uh, Bruce and I worked on this framework, which we uh, lovingly labeled Astronomaly. Um, so it's an anomaly detection framework for astronomical data, hence the name. So what it is, is it's a Python backend running a fairly standard machine learning anomaly detection pipeline. You can read in data, and you can read in almost any type of data, optical images, radio images, time series, spectra, whatever you want. So kind of any kind of astronomical data. Then there's a step called feature extraction, which I haven't talked about, but is actually a very critical step, which is a way of kind of simplifying your data for the machine learning algorithm. This is going to impact the type of anomalies that you might find. Then the next step is machine learning, so doing some anomaly detection, and then the algorithm is going to sort your data from what it thinks is most to least anomalous. Then comes the interesting bit. There's this loop, which is the active learning loop, where you can use just a little bit of human labeling, just a little bit, in order to improve the algorithm and show you more of the anomalies that it thinks that you're going to like. And to do this bit, I built a front end in JavaScript that looks like this, that allows you to very quickly go through your data uh, and, and label it in a, you know, it only takes a minute or two to label 100, 200 examples. So if you're interested, the paper is out and the code is publicly available. So please do play around with it and uh, let me know if you need any help. So let me show you a few examples of this thing actually working uh, in action. So this is the astronomical interface running on the Galaxy Zoo data. This is a uh, citizen science project with optical uh, galaxies that are labeled. And what I'm showing you is some random examples. So you see most of the galaxies in the data set are things like ellipticals, spirals, fairly ordinary, boring galaxies. But uh, if you run the machine learning and sort it from most to least anomalous, you can see it does a reasonably good job at picking out things that are visually a bit more unusual. They might be interacting galaxies or mergers, but you'll notice that there are some artifacts. So if you look at the bottom, you'll see the numbers are changing. That's because I'm labeling things as I'm going along. And I'm labeling it not with a hard label, like, yes, this is an anomaly, no, it isn't, but just based on how interesting I think this object is. So it's actually a continuous label. And if you use that to run our novel active learning algorithm that we came up with, and then you sort it by the, the new score, you see that it does a better job at just kind of getting rid of the artifacts. It pushes them further down the list. It's not perfect, uh, but it does a, a reasonable job. And to kind of see that in summary, you can see here's 12 examples of random galaxies, so the normal galaxies. Here's the top 12 machine learning uh, identified anomalies. You can see the artifacts in there. And this is after just running a little bit of active learning. Uh, I think I labeled about 100 examples here out of 60,000. And the nice thing is these are examples of galaxies I haven't labeled yet. So you can think of it like if you ever watch uh, a video streaming service, and it says, oh, users like you like this movie. You know, it tries to learn your tastes and recommend movies to you. This is recommending interesting astronomical anomalies. Uh, I can't possibly give a talk without showing some Meerkat data. So this is from the uh, uh, Meerkat Galaxy Clusters Legacy Survey. I think Kenda's talking about this uh, later in the week. And what I have here is I've taken some sources from the survey, uh, and I've just put a fixed uh, cutout around each source, and I'm showing you some random examples. So most of what you see are kind of point sources and boring. Um, and then if I run, interestingly enough, the exact same algorithm that I did for the optical data, 
uh, works pretty well for the radio data as well. And you see that it is picking out things that are morphologically a little bit more interesting than just ordinary point sources, et cetera. And here again was the, the top 10 um, galaxies. I have some updated results for this, but I haven't added them in yet. Um, okay, finally, I'm gonna wrap off with a couple more examples just to show the kind of flexibility of this framework, what it can do, hopefully exciting lots of you about it so you can apply it to your own data. This is the same algorithm applied to Decal's data. This is led by a student of mine. He's now starting his PhD with me, Vilan Etzebeth. And this was interesting because this, this is a beautiful uh, 9,000 square degrees optical survey, but it's much less curated than the Galaxy Zoo data. It's much noisier. Um, there were many more artifacts. So we had to do a lot of work just on the data processing side, actually. The machine learning was pretty easy for this, but just to get it to work. Um, but it worked pretty well for, for decals. Uh, to show you that it works not just with images, but also for time series data. So this is um, work led by my master's student who's just graduating in April, Malema Ramanyai. And he applied the same framework, just with a different choice of that feature extractor. So the thing of simplifying the data, um, everything else stays the same. And this is running on CRTS data. And it does a pretty good job uh, at identifying some sort of oddly behaving variable stars, flare stars, et cetera. But there's still uh, some work that needs to be done to improve these particular features. And then uh, this was a very, very nice example of an application to transient data. So this is work led by Sarah Webb. She's now a postdoc in Australia. She came to me with a data set of like, 100,000 light curves from the deeper, wider, faster survey. So these are minute cadence light curves. No one had looked at them. No one had labeled them. So even 100,000 objects, she didn't really know how to manage. And we dealt with this data set in a fully unsupervised framework. So no training required. Um, and through this and through applying astronomy, she was able to find some variable stars that have been discovered already, make some new discoveries of variable stars, and also find this ultra fast flare star. So it's a nice example of how you, you, you can actually do almost like a cold start with new data using these techniques. Finally, the last uh, thing I want to talk about, which is where I'm currently most excited, is applying deep learning techniques. So you might have heard of deep learning. You may not really be very familiar with it. It's a branch of machine learning that uses these very deep, complicated neural networks. Uh, and it's really been revolutionary for the field of uh, image recognition. And so this is using a supervised deep learning algorithm in an unsupervised way as a kind of feature extractor. And so you can see that the, the green, you don't have to worry about what it is, but the green line was my results with Astronomy. The blue line was the results with this uh, deep learning approach. And it's just significantly better as an anomaly detector. So it's a better representation of the data. Um, so this is something we're now trying with uh, a few new data sets. And I think in the field of unsupervised learning, this representation learning is something that's becoming pretty huge and pretty important. Okay, the last thing that I want to say is not science related, but I always take every opportunity to advertise. So I'm the founder and director of the Supernova Foundation, which is a mentoring program for women and gender minorities in physics. So if you're interested in becoming a mentor or mentee, please take a look at the website and please advertise this broadly. We, we're a very global program, but we do struggle to, to really penetrate into Africa. So it'd be great if you could share this with your networks. Okay, so to conclude, basically machine learning is uh, critical in, the, in facing this incredible data deluge. And I think if we, if we don't wanna miss these great scientific discoveries, we do need to automate anomaly detection to some degree, but you always need that human component with the active learning loop. Our attempt to try and solve this is called Astronomy. Please do check it out and email me if you get stuck. And do check out the Supernova Foundation if you're interested. Thank you very much. Uh, questions from online and uh, people in the room. Uh, I don't know how to see. Uh, 
So thanks, Michal. That's a very nice, very nice talk. What I wondered is um, in your in your framework of unsupervised learning, where you have the say human feedback loop, um, if it might be worthwhile to there use a supervised learning approach to get rid of the known unknowns, as you call them, because you could simulate them. Um, well, I say they are known, um, and by that reduce the human interaction time even more. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I think in the face of something like Ruben, we'll have no choice but to do something like that because it's just simply too high a data volume. And it's also kind of a waste. Like, you don't want to be spending time on things that you already know what they are, right? So, you would probably have so the, the framework for Ruben is they have these brokers which run multiple machine learning algorithms trying to categorize uh, incoming transients. And so all the things that you're pretty confident about, you know, what they are, we don't need to bother putting that through anomaly detection. But even so, we're still going to have fairly high false positive rates and high volumes of things that we're going to have to figure out how to look through. So I think there will be this iterative process of taking out things that you don't know. But I mean, another point that I want to make on that is, is something like Meerkat, where we have incredible sensitivity, the kind of sensitivity we've almost never had. You don't want to be too strict too early in case you start throwing out things that you're interested in. Um, and then, you know, another project that we're working on is with Meertrap, which is looking for um, pulsars. But specific, like one of the things that uh, Ben Staffers is particularly interested in is trying to find weird objects, like weird FRBs, weird pulsars. And they have they have a very um, a very strict machine learning algorithm running in the background because they just have such high data volumes. So it's very good but they're really worried they're missing things that are interesting. So, so it is definitely room to use both the supervised and the supervised approaches in practice. Yeah. David. Um, <clears throat> when you start getting thousands or millions of new transients, uh, you'll find, I think, after a while, that some things that you thought were anomalous at the beginning are now actually not. Um, so how do you cope with, as things evolve, saying, okay, this is just like an interesting <coughs> cataclysmic variable, but it's like not anomalous. Yeah. Um, and and we'll, we'll probably find that starts happening pretty quickly with Ruben. Like we'll, we'll, we'll find some new anomalies, but then it will actually just become this known class that we're not interested in anymore, yeah. So I mean, I think, the, the way I envision using astronomy in that context is in an online mode with kind of continuous feedback and continuous improvement where you can incorporate the supervised aspect as well. So once you have enough examples of this thing, you can actually train an algorithm to just look for them and then label them and you don't have to see them anymore. Um, but also to keep improving the active learning part. So obviously, um, interests will change as well and uh, it's an evolving situation so I think you you do need to think about running it in a very online mode and what also gets interesting there is how to incorporate because because I've always been using astronomy from a personal standpoint like what are you personally interested in but of course we have a whole community right and so you can start leveraging the fact that you've got a community like making labeling things and you can actually start using that as a, as a kind of pseudo-citizen science approach. So I think you definitely have to go on the kind of online aspect because you're right, things are obviously going to change. Renee. Yeah, just uh, thanks for a great talk as usual. Um, the question is actually, here you pick probably up things that you would classify that have got quite a good signal to noise ratio. Um, is there any way to train it to actually also pick up things that might not be as obvious, you know, things that are actually connected, but you don't see it because it's, there's not enough flux at certain pixels and things like that. Um, yeah, that was kind yeah. of my question. Yeah, no, that's a very good question. Um, so, you definitely can, and like for instance with the decals data, we were looking at different subsets. Like we were specifically looking at like the brightest subset, the kind of the faintest subset, trying to see, uh, because 
the really obvious ones are going to get picked up easily, but then the, the fainter stuff becomes, as you say, very interesting. Um, so, so you definitely can focus in on what particular subset you want. But the, the challenge with low signal to noise is machine learning algorithms traditionally don't do well with low signal to noise. Um, you'll get a high false positive rate. And it's because a lot of the development of machine learning is driven by industry where they don't think about uncertainty information. Whereas, of course, we're scientists, we're exclusively interested in uncertainties. So like one of the algorithms that we worked on a couple of years ago called BADAC uses a Bayesian approach to incorporate the uncertainty so it's more robust to, to the low signal to noise. And then the, the other aspect that I can mention on signal to noise specifically is um, at the end of the day, you look at an image in two different ways or whatever data in two different ways. There's how the algorithm sees it and then there's how the human sees it. And that can often actually be quite different. And so one of the things Astronomy does is you can apply various transforms to the data, whatever pre-processing is sensible. So like with the radio data, for instance, I will often apply something like a sine H transform, a local transform for that particular object to, to see things more clearly. Um, but you can do slightly different things to what goes through the algorithm versus what goes to you as a human to make it easier for you to pick out some of the fainter detail. So, uh, and this is actually something that we studied with the decals data as well. So that, that's, when it comes to looking on the low signal to noise, like how you actually transform the image uh, becomes very important. And it becomes very important in, both in terms of how you pick out the faint detail that might be interesting, but also how the algorithm picks it out. So it ends up coming down to a lot of the, the pre-processing steps that are required. That's a good question. Thanks, Michelle. So, um, the next speaker is Dr. M um, Michael Bakes. Um, uh, Mike helped me with that pronunciation. And uh, he'll be talking to us about the African Millimeter Telescope project in Namibia. I think they just had a, a big announcement, and we'll hear about that. Um, for the last three speakers, I'm looking for one of you to save me time. We are a little bit behind. Sorry. Good, good, good afternoon, everyone. And first of all, uh, many thanks to the organizers for not just the great occasion we have here, but also for inviting me over. Um, you see, this first slide is a little bit crowded. I'm not sure if I can. Oh, yeah, there you see the. Um, the cursor. So I'm based at the University of Namibia, which is literally in Namibia and not in Germany, as it says on my tag. Um, but I also hold a position at the uh, visiting position at Northwest University. Um, I'm also a member of the Global Young Academy, and whoever wants to talk to me about that is very welcome. Um, and from this, you already see that I wear a couple of hats, and besides mainly talking to the African Millimeter Telescope, to you, I'm also head of the Namibian Hess Group, and with the latest um, publication in science just coming out last week, Thursday, I couldn't come here without at least showing you the one slide that we detected very high energy gamma rays um, from the recurrent nova Aris of Yuki. Um, you can find all the details in the um, science publication there and the beautiful image on the right by the um, Science Communication Lab at DAISY in Sweden. So with that, let me dive into the Event Horizon Telescope and the magnificent image that was taken of the shadow of a black hole at the center of the active galaxy M87. You see here the, um, the little video um, that was zooming into the galaxy from afar. That was the same video that was shown at the press conference um, and in the meantime, even more information, particularly also in, um, in a multi-wavelength view of this active galaxy um, was published. And also there, without going into the, the, the many details they are in this, um, in this image, uh, you can see well, literally the radio on the left, I think then is um, the optical and the x-rays to the right, at different scales, you can zoom in into this AGN. Um, but what you see in the background is the network for BLBI observations of the
Namibia. So having a look Um, you will find the Namibian borders outlined essentially like that. And as we're here in South Africa, you know all where the Mercat is located, where the Southern African Large Telescope is located. And I also brought you where the Hass Telescopes, the High Energy Stereoscopy System is located just 100 kilometers southwest of Windhoek, the capital um, of uh, Namibia. So further, I just brought you a bit of information on Namibia. Um, which was compiled not by me, but by the Namibian um, Expo team for the Dubai Expo. And the one thing I want to highlight there is that Namibia is um, the second least densely populated country in the world, um, which quite obviously true for many African countries, but for Namibia in particular, uh, leads to pretty dark skies for most of the country you see. In the background of a world image, we've, we've seen a very similar image earlier. You see a blown up version of the Southern African region. Well, we are just here where it's quite bright at the very tip in Cape Town. Um, you see Windhoek quite nicely sp um, spiking out of the image. Uh, but except for that, there's not much light pollution in Namibia. In addition, what you need to do most of astronomy is cloud free nights. And what I brought here is the ever average annual cloud cover and you will see that in the southern hemisphere um, you have literally besides the mostly Chilean Andes um, you have essentially the southern African part uh, which is mostly Namibia and a bit of um, South Africa which are um, essentially cloud free for most of the year which gives quite good um, observation conditions and I can't be here without quoting um, Naledi Pandor, when she visited us in Windhoek a few years back, I will not read the quote, but I will share my interpretation of that with you, and that is that um, she essentially said, well, yes, there are many problems in Africa, and yes, they need to be addressed, but we should not only look to the problems, but we should also look to the opportunities, and astronomy is one of the fields which has great opportunity because of the geographical advantages we do have here already. So. I'm preaching to the converted here, I know, but I still wanted to make the point of that. Coming back to the map, I want to talk about the AMT, the Africa Millimeter Telescope that we want to build on Mount Gamsberg, which literally is um, 30 kilometers as the crow flies from the Hess telescopes. You can see it in the background of the picture to the right. The Gamsberg is a plateau, a bit like the table on here, just a bit larger, something like 800 meters times three kilometers in size. Um, there's currently only one um, optical telescope of, seven, of 70 centimeters diameter uh, that's used by amateur astronomers, and that's where we want to bring a radio telescope. Unfortunately, as you might guess also already from the quite winding road, it will be a little more tricky to get it up there than in this animation. Um, but, but, but we're up for, this, for, for the challenge and um, want to get through. So the Africa Millimeter Telescope was started as a project between Radboud University in the Netherlands um, with, with Professor Heino Falke there uh, being the leader of the group um, and the University of Namibia. And you see on the left, um, essentially some, some drone image of the plateau, um, as you can literally just, just see it yourself if you visit there. And what we want to do we want to use the um, essentially mothballed SEST telescope, which is still standing at La Silla in Chile. Um, we want to um, sort of break it down there, decommission it there, and bring it partly for refurbishment, partly for um, well additional components or actually newer components because it's quite quite an aged telescope, but to have all the mechanical parts of it reused. Um, the um, surface structure shall be um, a little better. It quite likely will not be as shiny and reflective as it is um, here, but will in the end be more like the dishes used at the Plateau de Bur, or uh, now it's called Noema Observatory in France. Um, 
What we're doing, this goes back to the image on the left, is we're trying to investigate actually how good the observing conditions on the Gamsberg are so far. For that, I had a master student um, who was working on uh, trying to get together three different data sets. There is an Aeronet station, uh, which measures PWV, uh, so precipitable water vapor, which is the main um, source of um, opaqueness to millimeter waves um, through measuring the, the sunlight or changes in the sunlight. Um, then there were some infrared radio major um, built on an instrument was, that was called Atmoscope. And then there's on the HES telescopes also for um, radio meters, but those only observed during nighttime. And he tried to get these data all together and admittedly struggled a bit here and there. Um, don't want to go through all the details, but what he found then for um, essentially 15 years was the uh, monthly average of the precipitable water vapor quite certainly or oh, quite certain we are about the seasonal changes. What we're not quite certain about yet is the absolute scale, as we have um, some indication that that might be a little off. So on the left-hand side, you see the data that um, a lot France produced. On the right-hand side, you see from Andrew Young, a colleague at Radboud, um, who interpolated um, a model, I think it's called Mera model, um, which is based on satellite data. And you see that in the absolute scales, there's quite some difference. You also see that the um, seasonal variation is quite the same. And we want to solve this conundrum with uh, two new instruments, which um, we will be deploying at the site, um, both being um, generously lent to us by um, Sarao, or rather Hartrao. Um, one is a direct measurement, um, a, a, radi a radiometer to measure the precipitable water vapor, and the other one will be measuring um, uh, the GNSS, so GPS signals quite accurately, and from there we can also um, get a measure of the PWV. What you see here is literally the, or part of the answer to the question, what the AMT would add to the existing Event Horizon Telescope network and by just adding a single telescope. So on the left-hand side, you see the UV plot and all the red lines are additional lines or additional connecting lines there by the AMT. And also on the right-hand side in the animation, you see that all the new lines um, through the AMT are highlighted in red. And so you see that just by one telescope, you have a couple of new um, connecting lines on which is actually the most important part in radio astronomy. In addition, you find here, and this I will only give you very briefly on this work by a PhD student, Labella, in, uh, at Radboud University, um, you will find here on the x-axis the observation time throughout a full day, and on the y-axis you just get what is called your normalized filling factor. The important thing is that um, points, or t points in time above this line of 0.7 are regarded as good enough to take proper images. And what you see in highlighted in blue is essentially the time that was capable of image taking before. And this is, well, actually, as I haven't said yet, the world as seen from Sagittarius A star, the center of our galaxy. And the times in red, on the red line here, is the difference that the IMT will make to the network compared to the line in blue, which is the current baseline. And this having it a bit more handy sort of is just for this very time, which is highlighted in red here, a comparison of trying to do an image without the AMT, which you see uh, in the center um, of the model. So it's a simulation, obviously. And at the right, you would see that during that time with the AMT, you would be capable of doing um, imaging. Um, but in addition to that, you also get um, more robustness to the whole network. So the, this slide looks a little crowded, but the um, arrangement of the images is all the same. Um, so it's on the left-hand side, four images. On the right-hand side, four images. Top left is always the current full EHT together with the AMT. Top right is without the AMT. 
um, bottom left would then here on the left hand side be with the AMT but without ALMA. And here it would be to under the right images, it would be with the AMT but without the LMT in Mexico. And you see here that um, without the LMT and as well as well without ALMA, but having the AMT, you have enough robustness in your network to actually do recover the image um, of the shadow of a black hole. Whereas on the bottom right, you would say without the AMT and without ALMA or without the LMT, you just don't get the image of the shadow. So there's a couple of science cases beyond this millimeter VLBI that I don't want to go into too much detail. Um, just very briefly, there is also a slightly higher um, wavelength VLBI network, as they called the um, global millimeter VLBI array. Um, and you see here that it's mostly situated in the northern hemisphere. Um, and obviously, by adding a telescope in Africa, we would open up the, um, all the southern sources there. Um, another main point, point is active galactic nuclei, blazers, um, which quite nicely makes here, well, as illustrated with this SED, a link to the um, gamma rays. You see an observation here, I think, by the SMA um, at millimeter waves. And the point I want to make is that um, only with the very highest frequency radio observations are actually part of the modeling because the other suffer from synchrotron self-absorption. Um, so, but as you can see here, there's a couple of more science cases which certainly will be possible and will be up to the user space to come up with um, additional, well, partly the additional instruments, partly additional ideas of what can be done with the instrument. What I want to do here is to do also a little bit of a bridge towards um, the next two presentations will be, that will be more in the education part um, of this conference. And that is because the AMT shall also have a more holistic approach by having um, an education um, branch built into the projects from the very beginning. And what we want to do first and already have started to some extent is to have a mobile planetarium for outreach work um, to essentially planning to go to all schools of Namibia um, in the foreseeable future with this mobile planetarium. Well, some pandemic came a bit uh, into our way, so the efforts were a bit stopped, but in May this year, if nothing serious happens to international travels, um, we will continue with that. And I'm also very proud to announce that we'll have our first um, PhD scholarship um, for and by the AMT um, in Namibia and um, coming back to the low number of inhabitants um, in the roughly 30 years of existing uh, of existence of the University of Namibia, this will be the only third PhD student at all in physics at the whole university to, to just give you a, a feeling of the scales there. Um, but even beyond that, we had um, a, a Master of Arts student in history to trying to establish um, which historical links are there to the location where we want to build the telescope. Um, and yes, you have quite recently, a month ago, also seen the announcement um, being picked up by Nature that Radboud University um, has already committed um, 12 million euro um, for the next 10 years of funding towards the AMT. With that, I just want to go counterclockwise through these images which show quite local support. On the right-hand side, you have um, colleagues from Radboud um, announcing uh, those fundings to UNAM end of last year. Then to the very left, we have um, signing of MAUs. These are our vice chancellor and the vice chancellor of Radboud University back in 2016. Then another uh, MOU was signed 2018, I think, and at the very center, you see um, Heino Falke, the, our PI, um, meeting our um, president, uh, Dr. Hage Geingob, uh, at the outskirts of the EU, EU summit um, just a month ago in Brussels. And with that, I just want to leave you with a slide of all the supporters, both institutionally as well as personally, um, and thank you for your attention.
we also have time for questions from um, online uh, participants. Uh, first one will be a quick question. Like the PWV measurements, were they taking on the head side or on top of the Gemsberg uh, hill? Uh, so, 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 so far they were taken on the head side, which is, uh, as, as I said, 30 kilometers afar, so essentially the same sky, but 600 meters lower. Okay, but. Um, but yes, it's point... better to take them. In situ. Yeah, 4.5 millimeters is probably going to only allow you to do up to band six um, in, in millimeter, roughly 300, 200 to 300 gigahertz. If you want to do higher frequencies, you will need to come down to a millimeter of PWV or less. Um, I, I, I did not mention that. Our plan is to, well, the baseline design is um, only essentially 1.3 millimeters or actually three millimeters and 1.3. So that's uh, 100 gigahertz and 200 yeah. something gigahertz. And there is some hope to be at 350 gigahertz as well, but that will depend on the exact quality of the site. Okay, just a second quick one is on the road construction. I do understand there are lots of discussions going on and lots of things, not very pleasant, but there was a consideration that I was involved in with the Tanzanian government on getting a cable car up to the mountain so that we can use it as a way to convey the hardware to put a small 10 to 12 meter uh, millimeter telescope on the Kilimanjaro mountain. Is this something you guys have considered? Are you insistent on constructing a road to drive up the mountain, or would you consider putting just cable and running things up the mountain and dropping your hardware? Well, well to our investigations, it doesn't make much of a difference in Cotton. several aspects, both okay. financially okay. Um, as well as the um, associated risks, as there had been quite some severe um, and I think even lethal accident with a cable car in Europe um, rather recently as well. And sorry, yes, well, <laughs> but but well, my 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 point is my point is that the road anyways needs to be upgraded if you want to drive cars up there. And so you 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 actually have to ch have to choose whether upgrading the road to some extent and build a cabled car or to more extensively upgrade the road. If you build a cable car, you don't need the road anymore. You can go up the mountain in the cable car. The operators can go up the mountain in the cable car. Anyway. Yes, but that needs some other level of cable car, which also then uh, has some, <laughs> some more financial implications. Sure. Um, well, the, the, the current timeline is um, for roughly five years because, well, it, it will need some time for shipment, for the reinstallation, for the refurbishment in between. Um, and as much as we appreciate the, um, the finances we got secured through Radboud University, uh, we are not quite there where we would like to be in terms of finances. Yes, we would get some AMT um, working with the amounts of money we have, but certainly not at the scale where we would want it to be. And we have a couple of funding applications currently running. We hope by end of year to have some more good news. Uh, thanks, Professor Beck. So if we can have some applause, please, Professor Beck. Um, the next speaker is Professor Mariana and Mariana Povic, and she's going to be telling us about ST or Ethiopian Space Science and Technology Institute. Um, and while she gets ready, just to remind everybody from um, the room, when you are asking questions, please wait a second for the mic, because the mic is helpful so that the people online can also hear you, your questions. Um, so. Thank you, Lero.
Okay, perfect. Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, everybody here in the room and then um, online uh, as well. So um, I'm currently based at Ethiopian Space Science and Technology Institute, and uh, the talk will be about um, the astronomy education for African growth uh, using uh, examples from Ethiopia and then East Africa as well. Okay, perfect. Thank you. So before I start, let me see if I can go to the next slide. I cannot. So for some reason, I can't go to the next slide. Okay, okay, that works. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Good, so before I start, uh, I would really like to first give my, uh, um, my thanks to uh, AFAS and then all the organizing committee that really worked uh, very hard uh, and uh, um, and uh, thanks to them, we, we are all here uh, today. And then my sincere congratulations to the society for really excellent work that has been done in the last three years. I remember when we were here three years ago, uh, just re-establishing uh, uh, the society and then saying that we want society to be really the voice of Africa regarding astronomy. So I think really the society managed that uh, thanks to uh, very hard work of the executive committee and the secretariat. So really my, my thanks uh, once again and, uh, and congratulations in, in that aspect. Uh, good, so uh, starting from, um, from here now, when I speak about uh, uh, the, the African growth, the development in Africa, I will be referring to this map here, to the 2030 agenda of the United Nations that has been signed by most of the countries. And you can see that here, just to remind you, we have 17 sustainable development goals that uh, each of them is really a huge goal with very uh, big uh, long-term objectives like uh, eliminating poverty, reducing inequalities, achieving gender, uh, gender equality, and so on. And basically, uh, if we really want to speak about uh, combating poverty, we have to think uh, about the measures that we uh, can use, uh, that we have to use uh, uh, for combating poverty in the long term. So education is really the key. As we all know, without education, we cannot uh, have science. Then science is another tool very important for long-term uh, uh, social economical development, and then technological development, innovation. And finally, uh, what is extremely important is that uh, we include the whole population. So empowering girls and women is really fundamental for achieving sustainable development goals. And in this aspect, astronomy, uh, together with space science, shown to be really an important tool for development. So just um, to remind you, so again, it doesn't change. Oh, let me see this one. No. OK, now, thank you. So there are some tricks. Okay, so uh, how astronomy can be an important tool for development? Uh, here are just some examples. There are not all of them. Uh, so the first one is that astronomy is one of the most multidisciplinary sciences. As you all know, it's related with all fundamental sciences, maths, physics. We have astrobiology, astrogeology, astrochemistry. It's also related with uh, other fields uh, that are more uh, focused on technology, like uh, computer sciences, engineering, uh, material sciences, Sciences, but also the humanities and uh, social sciences, like uh, um, uh, ethnology, anthropology, religion, uh, and so on. So that means that through astronomy, we can actually contribute to the development of all of those fields that I just mentioned. Then another very important point uh, is that every time that we have the development of the next generation telescopes and uh, new instruments, we are actually bringing the new technological developments and innovation and astrophysics astronomy is really one of the leading sciences in that aspect. Then we also know that uh, due to the dark skies that uh, we basically have totally free access to, uh, not uh, uh, everywhere, but uh, those countries who manage to preserve their dark skies um, and then to use dark skies for the social economical uh, growth are really benefiting significantly from that, such as uh, the examples that we have here in Spain, uh, in uh, Chile or, uh, or Hawaii. 
And then uh, uh, also just another reminder is that astronomy is really in the heart of the current digital uh, revolution and uh, also in the heart of the coming uh, artificial intelligence uh, revolution. Uh, through the, here are just some examples, no, uh, the invention of the Wi-Fi that nowadays we can't imagine our life without and the, the basic idea actually uh, came from astronomy and then the strong contribution of astronomy to the grid computing, the GPS systems, uh, through the CCD cameras, all the communication that is going through the mobile phones and so on. And then the contribution also to the big uh, data and big uh, science through the large data sets of galaxy stars that, uh, that we have. So now when we come to the African context, uh, this is the picture that I'm sure many of you saw uh, uh, already many times. Uh, so astronomy is really an emerging field uh, in, uh, in Africa. We heard that in the previous talks as well. This is the picture that uh, is only mapping some of the, it's actually from 2018, from the paper that we published. So this is only in terms of the infrastructure developments that are there, including some of the uh, site testing projects that are uh, going on. And then here on the left, uh, you can see uh, the map of uh, amateur astronomical societies that were, uh, th 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 there are more than 70 of them. And we can see that even when we go to the other side, just the, the public awareness and the interest in the general public about astronomy is also increasing. Uh, so when we come to what are all the signs now of the astronomy growth in Africa, there are actually so many of them. One of definitely uh, significant signs uh, is the the strong, the, the significant uh, uh, increment of the number of MSc PhD programs across the continent. So many countries, some of those I, uh, I mentioned here, not all of them. Uh, so many countries now have uh, MSc PhD programs running. Then that brought also to the strong um, increment in the number of uh, professional astronomers. Uh, uh, then the infrastructure development site testing, as I uh, mentioned previously strong institutional developments. So now we have many more space agencies. Some of them have been mentioned in the morning, uh, then uh, new research centers, and then uh, many other, uh, many universities with now new departments that are also focused on astronomy, space science. Then the reestablishment of African Astronomical Society is definitely one of the significant uh, um, uh, points that are also showing this growth of astronomy in Africa and the need that we have this kind of society. Uh, and then also there is, we can already start seeing the change in the political engagement, you know, so now the African Union is speaking about the importance of astronomy, space science in their post-development agenda in 2015 the importance of uh, all of these fields for uh, uh, achieving sustainable development goals. We now have the African Space Agency, the very first uh, space strategy uh, on the African uh, continent and so on. Uh, then um, uh, that is also um, uh, going in line with many difficulties and challenges that are there. Here I mentioned some of them, not all of them. Uh, so some of those uh, uh, are that, uh, well, many of the countries are just starting now with astronomy and many of them are starting from scratch, which means from scratch with all the human capacity development, institutional development and so on. And then uh, that brings uh, actually many different challenges. First, because the number of human resources is limited. Um, um, then uh, in general it's a limited qualified sector that can support all the needs that are there so that uh, uh, brings uh, again different difficulties then regarding the uh, development of the technology infrastructure but also just for the human capacity development or institutional development very often all the supportive infrastructure that uh, that is needed actually for then scientific development is not there so that also takes a lot of efforts that very often we find out when we actually start already working on uh, specific projects. Lack of the funding, but especially secured on the long term is definitely one of the challenges that we are all aware of. And then especially support from the local governments. You know, that is extremely important if we really want to speak about sustainable development in, in astronomy in Africa. So this is something to really work on uh, uh, much more in the future. 
there are many difficulties day to day that we are uh, all facing. Uh, uh, and then this is one point that we know that astronomy is still not inclusive in Africa. So it's still not accessible to everyone, uh, including countries and then gender and then uh, minorities. So uh, this is again something that uh, then languages that are a huge barrier. Uh, so uh, uh, the, la the, uh, the last point I would like to mention is the need for awareness. So we still as a community have to do a lot of awareness among the decision makers, policy makers, and then the general community, how actually astronomy can uh, contribute to the development of uh, African continent. So when we come to now the uh, uh, impact of astronomy education uh, and how we can contribute to the SDGs, um, Basically, we can, through astronomy, contribute to all 17 uh, sustainable development goals. But I will now focus on these eight uh, using, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, the examples from, uh, from Ethiopia and East Africa, uh, starting from uh, quality education and then gender equality, uh, the SDG 8 that is related with the decent work and then economical, social economical growth, infrastructure and of innovation, then um, uh, the peace and strong institutions, collaborations, and then finally these two that in my opinion are the, uh, the most important ones. One is to reduce uh, inequalities uh, in the world and among countries and then to uh, eliminate poverty. So uh, the examples, there is a huge amount of work that has been done uh, in, uh, in East African region. Um, I'm based in Ethiopia, so that's the, the, uh, the example that I know the most. Uh, uh, so I will just uh, give some of the examples uh, how actually through astronomy we can directly contribute to improve the quality of education. Uh, so one is uh, starting with the postgraduate programs. So for example, at the ESSTI, the Ethiopian Space Science Technology Institute, the postgraduate program that we have in MSc PhD is one of the big activities that we are running. Here you can see the number of the students that graduated, those that are still uh, attached. Uh, and uh, I would like also to mention that from Ethiopia, we are also offering a strong support in lecturing and then student supervision and have strong collaborations with Rwanda, Uganda, Tanzania, Kenya, and South Africa. Uh, here you can see some of our very first uh, MSc PhD students. And this is just an example um, uh, under the extragalactic astronomy group that we have at the ESSTI since, since 2016, uh, the number of students that graduated in MSc PhD and the number of students that are currently uh, under their uh, studies, some of the projects that I will not have time to go through. But uh, what I want to raise uh, here with this slide is that all of the people that you see here uh, are actually already uh, lecturers at some of the public universities, either in Ethiopia or uh, Uganda, Rwanda, Tanzania. That means that when they finish their MSc PhD, they will go back, they have commitment to go back to their university and then to continue teaching for some number of years. Uh, so that is uh, definitely a direct impact to improving the level of higher education in Ethiopia and East Africa. And then uh, something that I'm really very proud of is that through this uh, research, through the research, we actually managed to strengthen collaborations between East African countries. So uh, for example, with a project of, uh, with a PhD of Antoine, we have a collaboration between uh, Rwanda, uh, South Africa, Ethiopia, with a project of Beatrice between Ethiopia, Uganda, uh, Rwanda with Daudi between Ethiopia, Tanzania, and South Africa. And this is something that uh, uh, over the past years I've been um, seeing that it works really, really very, very well for strengthening the collaborations, but also uh, for um, giving more visibility to the science that is done in, uh, in uh, uh, Africa. So basically some of the impacts uh, uh, that we can see just through the fundamental research uh, is uh, first, the development, the contribution to the knowledge generation, uh, but coming from Africa, then astronomy science development, human capacity development that I mentioned, and direct contribution to the high, uh, edu uh, higher uh, education, then uh, creation of the strong uh, qualified sector, because as you know, uh, during uh, the MSc PhD program, uh, people don't learn about astronomy, they develop many other skills in computing, programming, uh, uh, scientific writing, statistical analysis that then can be used uh, in many other different fields. 
Uh, also, the support to the Entoto Observatory that we have in Ethiopia, that some of the projects are related, and then uh, th this inc increase the probability, possibility for future technological developments because having qualified uh, uh, sector, I mean human, uh, I mean qualified uh, uh, people uh, in the field is the first, first uh, uh, criteria for the technological development after. Uh, then uh, the strengthening of international collaboration. So basically all of the projects uh, are strong collaborations either within Africa or between uh, the uh, East African region and then European countries. And then um, also giving more visibility to science than in, uh, in uh, Africa. So all of these that I mentioned actually can be related now with different uh, sustainable development goals. Another point uh, that we also observed is uh, how actually through astronomy we can uh, benefit uh, and contribute to the development of other uh, uh, parts of educational system, for example, training the teachers. We found that uh, through astronomy we can actually promote different methodologies among teachers and one of the examples uh, are the trainings that we are doing uh, under NASA, the Network of, uh, uh, for Astronomy School Education. Uh, and under NASA here, you can see Rosa, that is uh, one of my colleagues who is the, the president of, uh, of NASA. And basically with, uh, with NASA, what we uh, do uh, are the practical trainings in astronomy, where using recycled materials and um, uh, so basically using the recycled materials, materials that we have easily uh, in our access, we can uh, uh, present, we can show different physical astrophysical laws. So we did a number of trainings, uh, uh, then Rosa did uh, uh, many others, uh, uh, mainly in the northwestern part of uh, Africa uh, as well. Uh, and these are some of the trainings that have been focused on uh, the eastern part of uh, Africa. And then also we can observe every single time that we do the outreach uh, education activities in astronomy, uh, we can observe actually how much the, uh, the children, students get motivated for science and for education in general. So here are some of the examples we really have in Ethiopia, the continuous participation together with Ethiopian Space Science Society in outreach activities. And uh, only in 2019 uh, uh, at Entoto Observatory, we received uh, more than 10,000 students and children and then uh, uh, this is something really especially for the countries like Ethiopia that so many challenges are there and that it's still one of the poorest countries that we have in the world. Uh, having this kind of uh, facilities that the ch uh, children can, uh, can visit is really bringing the, the hope. Um, then uh, when we come to the SDG 5, that is gender equality, I will again give some examples how through the astronomy we can uh, actually contribute in the longer term. Uh, to empower women and girls. One uh, example is that first example that I will mention is not only focused on, okay, thank you, Lero. Uh, first example is not only focused uh, on uh, uh, East Africa, so it's the establishment of the African Network of Women in Astronomy. Actually, we will speak more about it uh, uh, on Thursday on the special session. So I will not go much into the details. What I would like to mention is that uh, uh, out of more than 100 members that we have, about 80% are actually young women, MSc PhD holders, uh, sorry, MSc PhD students or young uh, uh, early career researchers, which means that AFNO is really timing. Some of the activities that we have that I will mention more, uh, that we will mention more on uh, first day um, that we uh, went through in the last year, um, uh, were related with the virtual trainings, with uh, uh, different activities that we organized uh, promoting the women in science and discussing at different international meetings why uh, empowering women in science is actually crucial. And then uh, one activity that, uh, that was there from the beginning this year, we gave the very first uh, awards for women in astronomy. And here you can see the first two awardees, Marie for the early career, award and the Rene who is here with us for the senior uh, astronomer award so my congratulations once again we were really amazed with the the two CVs um, then another uh, 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 activity that I would like to mention uh, where actually we uh, uh, really saw very clearly the potential of astronomy uh, are the activities that we are running under the STEM for Girls in Ethiopia initiative that we started in 2019 with my colleagues from the uh, Ethiopian Society of Women in Science and Technology. In this case, with this initiative, we are focused on the secondary school girls 
in their age when uh, uh, they still didn't choose if they want to go to the humanities uh, uh, or to the fundamental science, I mean, to the STEM or to other fields. And we also started interacting with their teachers. We uh, also conducted a survey in order to understand some of the principal reasons why uh, the girls uh, are not choosing uh, STEM fields. And uh, uh, the main lessons that we learned from the survey and the interaction with the girls is the strong, that there is a strong interest, actually, but that very often the girls do not choose STEM first because of the lack of support from the family, from the community, and so on. Lack of the information, so what can they choose uh, do later on uh, with, uh, if they choose astronomy or physics? Lack of the role models, that they are just not having women with the similar fields uh, so that they can identify themselves with. And then we found many, many difficulties that uh, are there when we go to the remote and rural areas where actually 80% of the population are. So this experience actually brought to the motivation for uh, starting uh, the SciGirls uh, project that has been funded uh, this year under the OED uh, call. And this is uh, the project that will be focused on the girls uh, coming from the remote rural areas. So what we want to do in Ethiopia is to uh, actually, uh, so it's basically using astronomy for empowering girls in science. So we will uh, take the, we will select 40 girls from remote rural areas across the, the whole country, uh, depending on the safety security uh, situation. And uh, we want to train these girls, uh, promoting uh, astronomy, but also big data, infrastructure, leadership skills. And then we want to uh, uh, convert these uh, girls into advocates of STEM, so that when they go back to their communities, they actually uh, uh, um, uh, commit themselves to do the outreach activities to promote STEM fields. And we will develop material that they can use uh, for that, for promoting STEM. So this STEM will be promoted to all uh, boys and girls, but we will have girls that are serving as role models. So these are some of the expected outcomes. So the human capacity development, but also improving the communication skills of the girls, uh, uh, um, initiating the leadership uh, skills of the girls, understanding through these girls what is the scenario that we have in remote rural areas, and then also bringing more awareness for the regarding job opportunities in STEM uh, uh, in the whole uh, community. Few more examples, I, I see that the time is running, are the trainings uh, uh, in astronomy uh, that we can uh, contribute to the human capacity development. Here are some of the examples. We organized uh, more than 10 workshops uh, schools over the last few years. Uh, this, these are the two schools that are coming. Uh, Bennard is here for the sub-Saharan uh, uh, school uh, that will be happening in Uganda in September. So you can speak with Banner, the East African uh, uh, astronomy school that we hope to be able to organize in Tanzania. Uh, and then uh, just to remind you, in order to have all the technological development that we spoke about previously, and I will not have time to go through all the um, uh, uh, infrastructure that is there. Again, astronomy education is fundamental. So how through the astronomical education we actually can benefit? Well, again, through the trainings, through the workshops, uh, this is just an example of the two. In radio astronomy, the thanks to James, uh, we were able to promote radio astronomy uh, recently in the East African region. And this, this is the very first uh, national workshop in observational astronomy data reduction calibration that has been done mainly for the people out of Addis that are at different public universities that finish their MSc or PhD. They don't have mainly theoretical, they don't have any experience in optical, uh, in observational astronomy. And uh, this happened just um, uh, uh, 10 days. Uh, very briefly, astronomy can also contribute a lot to the promotion of the peace and then uh, uh, to bring stronger institutions uh, through the policy work strategy. Currently, there is African strategy for fundamental and applied physics. Lero will be giving the talk tomorrow. Tomorrow, no, Lero? Yes, tomorrow, so I will not go into details, but I really invite you to join the astrophysics and cosmology group that we have under the strategy. This is really an initiative that, that can, again, bring all of us to design the strategy where, do we, where we are and where do we want to go in future regarding the development of astronomy on the continent. And then when we come to the 
uh, SDG 17. Here you can see the example just uh, under the extragalactic astronomy group uh, in Ethiopia over the last uh, five, six years, all the international collaborations that we managed to establish, as I said, uh, simply through the uh, fundamental uh, research. And this is one of the examples uh, how, again, through the fundamental research and through the organization of the international meetings, uh, in this case, it was the very first symposium for the IU Symposium from, for East Africa and Ethiopia, and only the third one in Africa. And we actually managed through this symposium by bringing some of the best experts in the field and more than, uh, um, than 160 people. Uh, to actually benefit and do a broader community and do outreach activity, teachers training, uh, and then uh, uh, the training also for MSc PhD uh, students. So basically, when we now combine all of the previous regarding the astronomy education in different fields, in the long term, we can then uh, again contribute to uh, reduce the inequalities among countries and to combat poverty plus all the others by making actually Africa stronger and then more independent, uh, stronger, more independent and free uh, through the education, science and technology by empowering all people. When I say all people, I actually refer to 50% of the population focused on, uh, on uh, females and then all the minorities and uh, uh, underprivileged uh, communities. And I think I will not have time for the recommendations. I think we can maybe discuss on all of these recommendation points during the, I don't have time, no, Lero? Okay, okay, good. So <laughs> then uh, you can get in touch with me, uh, Lero, uh, people from uh, Vanessa and so on, uh, Carolina for different initiatives we mentioned and thank you very much. Do we have uh, questions, uh, please, for Professor Povich? Yeah. Hello, good day, sir. Uh, thank you for that Hello. great talk and the amazing work that you do. So um, I've sort of found that one of the main barriers in outreach is language. And um, in one of your slides, you mentioned that um, you have material translated into three languages. Now, in my own home language, the issue we face is that there are some terms that you can't directly translate for example, a planet. <laughs> and so now, have do you also have similar issues and how do you overcome them? Yes, exactly. Uh, yes, the language, as you said, uh, it's a huge, huge barrier. Uh, in Ethiopia, we have more than uh, 80 languages, then uh, many, many other dialects uh, that are there. So it's a huge, huge barrier. The languages that I mentioned there, uh, English is the one that is used uh, officially uh, at all universities and then most of the secondary schools. Um, and then uh, uh, Afanoromo and Amaric that I mentioned as well are the two most used languages in Ethiopia. So that's why we actually selected these three. No out of, as I said, more than uh, 80, no? Uh, how we will be able and will we be able to translate exactly all the, the material, uh, it's a question, you know, but uh, this material will not be so much, I mean, it will be focused on basic astronomy as well, so we might face the problems with the technical terms, as you said, but then also it will be uh, related with many other uh, components, you know, like what are the job opportunities that you can get in astronomy or physics you know, or space science in general? Uh, then uh, the part of the material will be related also about the gender and STEM fields. So why is it important to have more girls uh, and women in general uh, in science? You know? And if we don't have what we are actually losing as a, as a society? You know? So there will be uh, different uh, types of material. These are just two examples. You know? Uh, that then big data, data science, no, and how through astronomy, space science, we can actually contribute all different aspects of our society will be another brochure that we are also planning to develop, no? So not everything will be just focused on pure astronomy, no? Introduction to astronomy will be only one. So I think we have a question online that we should take um, to give uh, our online participants a question. Okay. Uh, please unmute or you are, uh, ask, please. Okay, Tinka. Good, day. good day, everybody. My name is Tinka Willett. Um, 
I'm talking from Cameroon. So um, it's the first time I'm attending the meeting for AFAS. So I wanted to ask questions concerning the outreach activities, because most of the time I see that the outreach activities are being carried out in particular countries, mostly Ghana, Nigeria, South Africa, and Ethiopia especially. So I was trying to ask because some countries are left out or some countries are not uh, actually included in AFES. For example, Cameroon, here we have not had uh, many of uh, activities in AFES. So, so I wanted to ask if uh, wise carrying out activities in AFES we can carry out in such a way that it covers globally all around Africa. Thank you. Yes, uh, actually, uh, maybe later you want to add uh, as well. I mean, uh, uh, as far as I know, it is one of the, the um, objectives to really reach all the countries. Uh, so regarding Cameroon, I think now we do have uh, more uh, people that are uh, involved, especially with the outreach activities. Actually, I cannot go back to my uh, to my presentation, but I think uh, regarding the even the astronomy amateur uh, societies uh, there are now in uh, Cameroon as well. Um, so uh, regarding professional astronomers, I don't think we still have, no, uh, I don't think we have in Cameroon professional astronomers, but you are very welcome to join, uh, to join us. I mean, you are very welcome. We definitely, as I said, uh, one of the objectives is really to reach uh, all the, the countries. So uh, if you are interested, you can join different initiatives that are there, the education outreach committee that with different activities that are running uh, under AFNOA with different activities that we are running for uh, uh, girls and, and women. Uh, and uh, uh, hopefully with time through that, we will also be able to, to start with uh, professional through the young people and by training young people with the professional astronomy in, uh, in Cameroon as well. I don't know, uh, Lero, do you want to add anything? Uh... No, just to also maybe say, um, we do look for champions of uh, activities uh, across the continent, and you can certainly be a champion, one of the champions of activities from Cameroon. So I think look at it as an opportunity um, for uh, activities rather than as uh, just uh, being excluded. Uh, uh, thanks for the great question. We have a question from the room here. Thank you. Thank you, Mary, Mary Anna, for all uh, on doing uh, in uh, to grow astronomy in Africa. My question, uh, what do you think, in despite the difficulty uh, to access to internet and difficulty to found the uh, found, uh, government, to develop and focus to develop small telescopes um, in remote, uh, to grow network, especially between students, and uh, we, we can develop more uh, connection uh, between all students in Africa. What do you think? Thank you. Yes, actually, I didn't have time to go through the recommendations, no? But I mean, uh, what I put there is actually the joint effort that is needed, you know? So basically, uh, from the collaborations that we managed to establish uh, within East Africa, you know, between Ethiopia, Rwanda, Uganda, Tanzania, Kenya, and then in collaboration, strong collaboration with, with South Africa and South in particular, um, so I really saw that, uh, I mean, uh, that's where the power is, no? when we really put uh, joint uh, efforts, because in each country still, uh, except few of them, no? like in maybe Morocco, a bit more in South Africa, definitely, uh, there are only few of us. So we definitely have to put uh, efforts together. No? So I think one of the things definitely is uh, to uh, focus much more on uh, joint research, joint collaborations, uh, strengthening the collaborations and networks within Africa, within the country, its uh, countries uh, themselves, and then regions, and then continent. Uh, and then another is like Materna, uh, the example of Materna, or now the Pan-African uh, Planetary and Space Science Network, you know, that is basically, you know, when we speak with young people, very often I feel sad, you know, when I speak with young people in, uh, in uh, Europe or in Uganda, you know, they all want to go abroad, you know, and uh, uh, besides that we have a strong problem with the brain drain, you know, um, uh, 
we have to really promote more the uh, uh, intercontinental uh, uh, mobilities, uh, research collaborations. So Erasmus program that, uh, that is there in Europe, it really benefited so much the science development, although it's on the undergrad level, but it benefited significantly the, the research uh, and the science and then research collaborations among uh, countries. So we definitely need something like Materna or the, the new network that I mentioned uh, previously. No? Um, to, so these kind of opportunities, I think, are very, very important. You know? uh, then regarding the, um, the public, I mean, the, um, the pr promoting astronomy through the governments and decision policy makers, again, since it's not an easy task, we again uh, have to put efforts uh, together. So AFAS is actually playing a big role in that and we can do much more actually in, in that aspect, yeah. Just some applause for the speaker, please. Um, our next speaker is Professor Jamal, our very own president of the society. And uh, we are going to put on his shoulders the uh, the task of uh, helping us with time since we are running over. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um, hello, everybody. So I have the task of talking about something which is actually bridging two worlds. I'm going to talk about those people who are passionate about astronomy without being professional astronomers. I'll be talking about amateurs, people who are going around astronomy, planetarians possibly, who could we define what is the minimum, the least, the least thing they should know about astronomy. Uh, the, the lower end, the higher end, Actually, there is no lower end, as you know. Everybody can practice astronomy, even if he's a flat earth person, actually. And uh, the higher end, you know, there's some astro amateur astronomers who are encyclopedic in their knowledge. They know even sometimes better than professional astronomers. So really, I'm talking about finding a middle ground, where a reasonable ground, where some people should know some hard facts about what we know today of astronomy, I mean, and uh, reasonable things. So. Let me try these many ways and many uh, possibly listing. That's maybe my listing. And I'll start by talking about the, um, okay, back. Oh, let's lift, how it, I went that way. Okay, first of all, the aesthetic part of, 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 of astronomy, just a, a party line kind of things, why astronomy is great and beautiful and all these things. Now, and then I go to the, the content aspect, first of all, what should a, a, a person who, who wants to go into astronomy, even at the amateur level, should know what is there in the universe. So I'll be talking about the way we study the universe, the solar system, but the extended solar system that we know today, the stellar world, what is the minimum things that we know about the, 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 the various stars and what they, the, the, and so on and so forth, and I'll end up with a brief inventory of the cosmos. Then the cognitive aspect, how do how, uh, how do the things work? But I'll be very brief in that because it's uh, certainly uh, very, <laughs> can go very far in that things and end up with cosmology and all this dark stuff that has complicated the whole story of what we thought was easy cosmology 30 or 40 years ago. Okay, so certainly astronomy, and I'm talking to my, to people who are convinced most likely of that is the most beautiful science. Although, of course, beauty is in the eyes of the beholder. But I'm going to tell you that even in that relative perspective, uh, I mean, astronomy brings several worlds together without even asking people to know equations. So it is a science which is very pe peculiar. You can practice it without doing any equation. That's, I don't think there's another question, any, any, any science which can do that. Of course, you certainly need to interpret things. If you try, if you try to, do astronomy without knowing what the things are. I mean, you need, you need to, to, to get some guidelines and physics, uh, astrophysics is the guidelines in understanding things. Otherwise you're just, uh, I, mean, uh, I mean, dreaming and, uh, and, 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 and making poetry out of, say, of beautiful scenarios. So let me say that astronomy is indeed the science, the, the discipline where 
for which all the superlatives uh, applies, and I'm trying, I know I'm talking to convincing, pe convincing people, but I'm trying to make a case in a systematic way. Also, Satan is the most beautiful discipline. Uh, maybe there will be some competition from crystallography, possibly, the, uh, the, 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 those beautiful crystals that we have, but then I can argue that crystallography is a very sub, sub, uh, I mean, level, uh, discipline, it's even part of, we can think of geology, geology is part of planetology, planetology is part of astronomy anyway, so leave aside uh, crystallography with the beauty of the crystals, is the most mysterious, we're talking about things which are very profound and very strange, and every time you are surprised, but the, the puzzles that it brings, the most adventurous, you, you go into all the scales and find things which are incredibly uh, complicated, sometimes very simple in other times. I'm not talking about adventuring of going there because you cannot go very far uh, in, the, in, the, in the universe from where we are. It's every time you hear about new discoveries, the high Z galaxies, new extrasolar planets which are quite close from our planet and so on and so on. It's also the most spiritual discipline possibly where you're asking existential questions, your place in the universe, about yourself and so on and so forth. So that's all the whole set of reasons why I think that astronomy cannot be challenged by any other science in the beauty and the fact that it's bring two worlds together, the knowledge, I mean, it's, it, there is the eyes, there is, there is everything for the eyes and for the heart and for the mind in it. So that's my, at least my take in that. It's also the easiest science to popularize without any doubt. You don't need any question. You need just to have, to be, to, to be able to be amazed. And of course, you set certain part of uh, amateur astronomy needs skills, but you don't need skills some more, more often to, prepare, to do a, a astronomy. People are, I mean, the young people are very engaged in astronomy because they know that's the, the easiest and the most beautiful science among all those difficult hard science that they heard about. Uh, you see, uh, also astronomy is the, the discipline which can fire up people's imagination. Look at those. Yes, I had something here in hand. People were listening to a talk and no, this, there's something wrong with it anyway. It's bring together edu education and entertainment. It's what is called edutainment. Perhaps the first people who have practiced this kind of, uh, of hybrid kind of knowledge are Benjamin Franklin in the Almanac, poor Richard's Almanac, that was in the 18th centuries, we're bringing I mean, science and, uh, and meteorology and, uh, and, and, and knowledge about seasons and so on and so forth, and it's of course went very far right now. So it's also, if you look at it in a, from, from a perspective of knowledge, you see, look at all, that's a glass of snake, as you might know, and people with, are in physics may know that, where you cover all the scales from the infinitesimal to the largest one. And you see everything at the right is astronomy, starting from, um, from planetary science, right? And to, uh, to, to, to stars and clusters of stars and so on, galaxies and so on and so forth. On the other hand, you can even make the case that in order to study astronomy seriously, you need to know atomic physics, if it's an interstellar medium, if we need nuclear physics, particle physics, go back even to the Planck scale, and then you will uh, see that both, both, uh, uh, the, both uh, ends are, uh, bringing, are brought together. So really astronomy is the overall, you cover almost all the scales uh, in, in, in the thing. So even you know, from an epistemological point of view, astronomy is covering a lot of ground. Now let before starting, because I didn't start really, I'm going to, to say what we need as an amateur, serious amateur. amateur. Uh, let me just clarify one point about the fundamental problem of astronomy when it is practiced by amateur. It is the fact that they often they are, they are missing the point that brightness is not the real, the real uh, criteria to find out what is there in the universe. You see, these pictures bring together three kinds of, uh, of, of celestial objects, a comet, stars, uh, I mean, sent, uh, gal um, light years away, and uh, a galaxy, which is, of course, as you know, very, very far apart. But for a person who is unknowledgeable, and if you have not, and the physics has not gone its way, then you will not know what is the most important object. People were afraid, in fact, in the past, about comets, although it's nothing. A comet, the, 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 the taste of comets, even if it's making tens of, tens of millions of kilometers, sometimes even hundreds of thousands of kilometers long, they are nothing, they are dust, 
few, perhaps few hundreds of tons of dust, which is uh, lightened by the, by, the, by the sun. And even if you try to find where is the comet itself, you might find it's just a small pixel in the middle of the, of the head. It's even, even not seeming, seeing, while stars are, of course, uh, huge, I mean, bodies of, uh, of, 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 of um, I mean, huge uh, uh, objects, while galaxies that you see in the background as a small, poor, uh, poor uh, celestial object contains hundreds of billions of stars. So that's the problem, of course, that you need to have physics to understand what you see, and astrophysics in particular, otherwise you are lost and you just have the, the beauty, uh, you just, it's a, it's, it's a thing you are beautiful, that's not enough, okay? So let's start now. Of course, if, what is the minimum thing that we know, should know? Of course, we should certainly, uh, amateurs astronomers should know that the Earth is round, right? It's a spherical, in fact. So I, don't, I do believe that there is no flat Earth people here around. And if they are, if, if they, if they are even, I mean, they, they can still practi practice astronomy. I mean, I don't, I don't care. But anyway, so that's the first big fact, and which I think should know by everybody. We know also the Earth is not the center of the universe. I'm starting with really simple st stuff, OK? But just uh, we're going to go as far as we can to, and, uh, and stay with the reasonable amount of knowledge. So there is no more Aristotle universe of Ptolemy universe uh, where we had the Earth which is fixed. We know that the Earth is, uh, is well, sun-centered, at least from the, from the re scientific revolution uh, that we, in, in, in Europe in the 17th century, and we have Copernic has started this whole thing, and then, of course, uh, uh, Kepler, Galileo, and Newton's the synthesizer. So, uh, of course, this is uh, partially wrong because it's, 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 the, it's, the, it's one pace one step in the right direction because, of course, the sun is not the center of the universe anymore. It's even is a very tiny part of the universe. Okay, so again, we should also say that we are stuck where we are. The astronomy is a stay-at-home science. We can ne never go very far. The, the farther we have been gone, I think it's Voyager 1, is like 23 billion kilometers from uh, our home, which is nothing comparing to the extent of space anyway. So uh, again, we, don't, we, 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 are, we are doing the things where we are, and we don't think in the far, even future, that we'll go very far in the, in the, in, inside the universe. So, uh, and also we should not believe that <laughs> the other, in the other end, those kind of things where we will be going from one end to the other end of the universe through wormholes or whatever. Or if you want to dream, of course, it's fine. But don't take it as science at this point and don't follow even Hawking's in that things, okay? We're talking about don't believe in, in, in Aristotle, don't believe in those things which really has nothing to do with what we understand today of physics. In fact, people have written, paper, written papers that it's, it's impossible to, to cross the wormhole. But anyway, so don't get people into this fantasy of, of, of believing those uh, things. Okay, now, the, the content aspect, what is there in the universe, and how, first of all, do we study the universe, and so on and so forth. So, I'm going to be quick, because usually, usually people, what's that? No, my friends. No, no, you don't apply it to me. Apply it to everybody, okay? I have 25 minutes, I take 25 minutes, and you have to manage everybody in, this, in a fair way, please, please. Because I just started, my friend. I have still to go the whole the course of things, come on. So, um, of course, astronomy is not also looking at nice pictures. Astronomers should know that it is really taking spectrum and studying it and taking and, and finding what is in, a, in, 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 those, in those objects. There is, of course, we study it by telescopes. Uh, that's the next big telescopes. Uh, the biggest telescope in the world will be the ext extremely large telescope. We study it in various wavelengths. Next to us in Namibia, there is a HES telescope in gamma rays, in radio telescope, and so on and so forth. Also, there is other ways. I'm not going to go into those details because it's maybe too much for astronomers, but also we use neutrino telescopes, which are either fishing or ice fishing for neutrinos and going in the other direction that the, the, the sky, that's another story, but you should know that there is other messengers that we use not to study the universe. Also there's gravitational wave telescopes that we know it's a new way of probing the universe. And uh, okay, 
No, just quickly something I'm not going to talk about, but at least say what they should start learning about the, the inventory of the universe, starting from various classic classes that you see, planets and small bodies, uh, stars and their bestiary, because we there's all kind of stars, not is not one single one, nebulae and galaxies, and then go beyond the galaxies, and also various exotic objects that we don't know precisely what they are, or we are starting learning about that, AGNs, X XRBs, kilonovae, and the fast radio burst and so on so on. So that's maybe a list of what they should be starting learning lead by lead if they are really into those things, but that's not of course necessary. So I'm not going to talk about all those things except perhaps the first uh, part, which is the simplest one, the objects in the solar system. Then I will talk about the extended solar system because it's no more the story that they read in the books, in their textbooks, that the solar system is, uh, you know, starting from the sun to uh, possibly Pluto or possibly start stopping at Neptune. There is now a much far larger ones whereby you have uh, creeper belts made of asteroids and then you have the Oort cloud and so on and so forth. So they should start learning the new solar system of the 21st century and not the old one, which are just the pieces of uh, rocks, big rocks, uh, ga gaseous study uh, objects and so on and so forth. And they start, of course, learning that now it is a new field, which is called Planet, uh, I mean, exoplanets, whereby we discover uh, planets by thousands, but that's in the news, and I think they, they, they mostly they, they can update themselves with that. And there's the, 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 the rate of discoveries is incredibly fa fast. It's almost going exponential right now. Uh, now, talking about stars, and we, the best star that we can think about is our, our sun. Let me say, uh, okay, so that's from the, okay, but anyway, so st certainly stars, uh, there is, okay, that was uh, Kurt this morning was talking about, uh, uh, Kurt, right? This morning we're talking about the Ed Eddington's uh, mistake of thinking that the sun and uh, had the same distribution of elements than the earth, but he was not too wrong, actually. If you take away the helium and the hydrogen, indeed the sun has almost the same composition of the planets. And uh, indeed, the, the, the composition of the universe should be also part of the knowledge of people, that there is hydrogen and helium, which is mostly in stars, and some planets are, uh, have the other elements. But the most important thing, I believe, is to know the difference between a star and a planet. A star is a star because it's a huge body, and it's in, 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 in terms of mass, its mass is thousands, even a tens of thousands, the mass of a planet. A planet is a planet because it's a small body. It can never reach the temperature of fusion inside. Uh, so the size, the mass, and the light which is produced, is, uh, is, is, but all is controlled by the mass anyway. So that's the reason why a star is a star and a planet is a planet. I'm not going to go into that. You can, the people can go further. The stars also, that's one of the things that often as amateurs cannot realize, stars are suns. And our sun is a star. It's, it's obvious for all of us, I believe. But often people are, are stuck with and not understanding that stars that we see are those tiny uh, bright spots are really suns. And if our sun was put at that distance, it would be shining as a star. And they have also that they are evolving from, uh, they, they, they have a kind of birth and, 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 and late stage evolution and so on and so forth, but most of them, of course, we see them in the main sequence and so on and so forth. So that's, they can go into those things and there are a lot of things uh, that they, they, can, they may learn, but at least that they know that the, the kind of uh, stability of the star or the eternal vision of the star is wrong and that the stars are really only in the main sequ sequence and they have a cataclysmic uh, end, but really they are, uh, okay. So, uh, yeah, the star forming regions and so on. Also, what is most important about the stars is the explosion of stars, which you call supernovae. That's the one which make the, no, I'm sorry, I have my watch. I have my watch, sorry. Uh, okay, so the supernovae, they are the one who are create, I mean, the whole chemical evolution of the, of the universe is, is based on those stars, which are exploding and they are making all the elements, so that's, you know, the, the, they can go into the stellar evolution and according to the mass and so on and so forth. They can read about Kilonove, how they completed the picture of the, what we know about the stellar evolution, and they can end up trying to, finding that the, the, uh, the, 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 chemi the periodic elements can be well explained by astrophysics, one of the biggest, in fact, success of astrophysics by understanding the stellar evolution and so on and so forth. I'm going to be quick. I'm going to be quick. I'm going to help you. But you, you <laughs> he's the vice president, I'm the president. But come on, come on. For not too long, for not too long, for a few more days. Okay. 
Well, yes, but then what, what can you do? Then you have, it's a mismanagement, really. Okay, let me try to, what, I can stop, I can stop, okay. I should stop then. I was talking about the, the world of galaxies, I'll be very fast. And what's, well, well the connective aspects, I'm going to go through it. The, 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 I'm going to say one thing about cosmology and I'll stop that. What people should know about cosmology, uh, because cosmology, that was one of the great cosmologists uh, that which say something which started, which make you understand that you should not take uh, uh, the cosmologists by their word, you should take it with a grain of salt. That was Lando. He said people, cosmologists are often wrong, but never in doubt. So you know, a few, few decades ago, people believing that you can understand the whole destiny of the universe, all the fate is imagine with one single parameter, just the, the average density of the uh, local um, matter, which would be enough. Now we know with the, 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 the dark matter, dark energy, everything has changed. We're not going to talk about those things. Uh, not talking about the CMB, which is a necessary discussion, understanding because all cosmology almost is based on that. Uh, that's the, 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 the earliest picture of the universe that we can have. Uh, but the whole shift a paradigm their paradigmatic shift which has taken place a uh, few decades ago tells you that you should not take uh, i mean uh, to the letter what uh, cosmologists are saying right now we believe that there is of course most of it is is non ordinary matter non hydraulic matter we don't know what's in the future let me just finish with this also there is various speculations about the possible multiverses, monster universes, and so on and so forth. Maybe possibly the next stage of knowing the universe will be introducing the living, and that's maybe a revolution for the next century or two centuries. We might find out that this other kind of, of organized matter, which is perhaps living, we don't know anything about it. I'll stop here, but sorry for having been very close to the end. Thanks everybody and thanks all the speakers for the uh, session today. Um, please um, have the opportunity to ask uh, our professor and president questions in the uh, tea room. Um, just quick announcements. Charles, you may come and help with me with the announcements. Uh, so there are, there are two parallel sessions now. The one is taking place here. So that's, uh, that's, that, that's on the, the collaborations. And then there's the one on virtual observatories taking place at the 1896 building. Uh, so it's either you stay here or you or you move on to the 1896 building for the virtual observatory. So the virtual observatory was was mainly targeted at at students. So if you're a student, you can you you you, you can move on to the, to the other side. Or if you are also professional interested in the virtual observatories, you can. And the announcement about the tour. Right. There is the there is a tour at half past four, which is optional of the SAO side. So if you're interested on on the tour for the SAO side, you you must just meet Christian outside at half past four. Uh, today, yeah, the transport will wait. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll ask them to wait. It's okay.